And I'm saying sometimes, just like, you know, when you're looking at the, 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 um, the quantum mechanics and, and all that stuff in space, the atoms, the electrons, and all that stuff, you can't see these things. But, so you have to find other ways to, first of all, determine that they're there, to find other ways to determine where they're at, to find other ways to determine where they will be without even actually visibly seeing them, okay? And, and, and what I'm suggesting today is, although we hold our traditional beliefs de so dear to our hearts, and we embrace them as, as the word of God and the only God, and, and anything that deviate, it deviates is against God. We have to begin critically looking at what we've embraced, and if we can't, it, it's impossible almost to simply challenge what you believe if it makes sense. But, but sometimes if you can step outside and look at the results of, of, of what you have believed and those that have believed what you have believed as well and, and recognize the corruption, you might begin to challenge some of the traditional beliefs, some of, some of those foundational beliefs that have been accepted. I know it's very difficult. It's very difficult, especially in this nation that's, you know, in God we trust, a, a nation that was, that was formed and settled on the principles of God, you know. I go tell that to the Native Americans, the African Americans. You know, was it really? And, and I think especially for Americans, that's the beginning of our troubles. That's, that's the beginning of, of, of the corruption. You know, the Bible speaks of, of a house built on sand, a house built on corruption, a house built on things that are not real, versus a house, you know, that's built sturdy. And, and so when you recognize even the house that, that we call this nation, as far as under God and indivisible and, and all this stuff, recognize the foundation it was, was not of God. The foundation was not of Jesus. The foundation was of thievery. You know, ask the Native Americans. The, the, the foundation was of torture and, and of slavery and of murder. Ask the African Americans. The, 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 the foundation of this nation as it pertains to God was not about God at all. And, and so this is what we have built, you know, the, the, our belief system on. What I'm suggesting is this false foundation, this, this fake uh, foundation that, that resembles a foundation, but it's not, not a foundation at all. And that, that's why it is corrupt. That's why we can look at America today and, and we, can find, we can find the positive, you know, message of, of anti-abortion, but we can still wave the flag to go killing folks. Folks, that, 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 that God sent Jesus to die for, okay? So there's a corruption in, in what we believe. And you can say, oh, well, you know, that's not right. This is America, you know, and all this stuff. But no, there, there, it's not about America as far as God is concerned. But God told of the world that he sent his only begotten son so that Americans know, <laughs> okay? So the Europeans know, so the Asians, Africans know, but for the world. And, and, and as we begin to, to, to divide it up, as we begin to set up these boundaries and see it's us and them, and, and it's okay if they die, but not just us die, it's not like that in the eyes of God, even according to Scripture. And Jesus tells us how we're even supposed to respond to our enemies and people that hate us. Why? Because Jesus recognized that although we've set up these boundaries, we've set up these nationalistic boundaries, we've set, we've set up these religious boundaries, we've set all these ethnic boundaries, all this stuff, economic boundaries as well. We are all brothers and sisters, children in the eyes of God. The God, according to John 3.16, loves tremendously. So critically thinking, we need to begin to look at what we've bought into, what we've embraced as gospel truth. And recognize, I find it very difficult to, to, to embrace that. And I know it's to the chagrin of some of my loved ones, to the chagrin of some of my friends and family members and all, but it just, it just uh, some of it doesn't make sense. And so, so it's not about God. God makes sense. <laughs> that which we've inherited from the Creator makes sense. That which we've inherited, we've learned from man, a lot of it does not make sense. And, and it's as, as simple as that. But it's so easy to accept what we've always believed. That's so why you can have children that, that will be anything. That can be Klan members. That can be Black Panthers. That can be, that can be uh, Republicans. That can be Democrats. That, that could hate other races. That could love other races.
because they learn that in the families that they've come up with. They didn't learn it from the source that all races emanated, that all cultures emanated, that all economic people emanated from. They didn't learn that from the source. They learned that from the environments in which they were raised. And so we really have to begin to try to critically look at our religions and, and try to determine which pieces of that which we have embraced are inherited from God and, 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 and those that are, have been learned from man. And the problem is with the Bible and any Bible, the Quran or any, any religious writing, you're going to have both in there. And it was very interesting, you always hear believers talking about rightly dividing the word of God. So if you're going to, and you know, I take issue even with that phrase because usually it's a phrase meant to simply justify the beliefs of the person spouting that phrase. But, but let me put it in another way. Yes, rightly, if this Bible or this Quran or your religious book or documents are, are to you the word of God, then you need to rightly divide it, rightly divide that which is of God and from that which is of man and embrace that which is of God. This is very difficult. It's very difficult for me because I was raised. You know, the King James Version of the Bible is the absolute inerrant, you know, and nothing else compares. It was very difficult to step out and challenge that. It's very difficult to step out and challenge a lot of things. But I think the first thing I had to do, the first step in, in doing this, was, was recognizing that, 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 that for the Bible, which is this program that we're talking about, as, as I'm a believer, is recognizing that the, the documents in this Bible are, are manuscripts created by many men, compiled by a particular council of European men, and determined that this would be our Bible. This would be our Word of God. Okay, So recognize that, that first of all, they were manuscripts <laughs> that were penned by men. Inspired and moved from God. Yes, but I'm inspired and moved by God. You're inspired and moved by God. So we write things, but even in that writing, there's going to be God and there's going to be you. And, and it's very difficult often to, to, to determine which is which, which is God and which is me, or which is God and which is you, or which is God and which is man. Then you had that council, the European council, the Nicene council, determining, well, what is actually going to be included? So you have another set of hands, another set of men's hands. So you have a lot of things going on. Now this isn't discounting God at all. This just makes it a necessity for us to, to seek God. Because God, as we understand, is alive and living. And, you know, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 tells us that the word of God is, is quick and powerful as, as a two-edged sword dividing asunder the soul and spirit. You know, the word of God is alive and within us. If, if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it, it'll be open. And that, we, and that he is found by those of us that diligently seek and pursue him. And so we just need to do that. Remember years ago, before Facebook, I was in an AOL chat room. Some of you all that are old enough remember those. And, and I was in a religious chat room. And man, there was a lot of bickering in those, if you recall. And I posed the question. And it's really, you know, what was really cool about the chat room, which, which Facebook, it's really not happening with Facebook, is that in a chat room, everybody in there was all in there at the moment. So if you type something in there, everybody immediately saw what you were typing in there. And I posed the question. I said, if you had your choice, and these were all supposed to be believers, okay, I, I, and you had your choice to lose something, which would you lose? Would you lose your Bible? and never have it again? Or would you lose your prayer life and never have it again? <clears throat> I'll say, I mean, people would just respond and all crazy and everything. Of course, lose your prayer life, lose your prayer life because you have the Bible, that gives you the understanding. But I'm saying no. Because your prayer life, that's, I mean, if you really believe, if you really believe that God exists, if you really believe a creator is present, if you really believe there is a source from which all things emanate and that source's ear is tuned to you, then, then would you rather have a biography of the source or would you rather have a real dialogue and conversation with the source? That is the question. And which do you think you can learn more from? If you had a biography of an individual that you're reading, or you had the actual individual there telling you, telling you the heart, the desires, and every, every aspect of their personality and being. Of course you'd want the person, the individual there. So I'm suggesting this. If you believe that God is alive and listens to, to and hears your prayers and responds to you in kind, then why would you want the biography in place of the relationship? 
And, and I have to submit that the only reason you'd want the, the biography in place of the relationship is because you really don't believe that individual is still alive. Now see, if an individual is dead, I want to go read about Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or, or you know, or, or George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or any of these guys. I have to go buy a book, a biography of this person. There's no way to talk to them because they're dead. Now, if you believe God is dead, then, then you need this Bible. This is the biography to get all you can, you know, to figure out what God is about. But if you believe that God is alive, talk to God and listen. So we have, we have some thinking to do. We have some critical thinking to do. Because the reality is we wonder why, why our kids aren't embracing the God that we love so dearly. We wonder why our grandkids aren't embracing the God that we love so freely. What if our friends, our family members, and our acquaintances, and even the church members aren't embracing, aren't embracing God who, who we love so dearly? Maybe, maybe there's an issue or two that we need to begin to look at. We might be the culprit. And, and, and so what I'm suggesting is that, that we have certain traditional beliefs that we have been given and that have been passed down to us that, that have simply been accepted as gospel truth. And, and, and even when we look at it sometimes and we read it over and over again and we say, well, we're going to be open, you know, to change, we're listening, but, but we still establish certain perimeters that, that nothing can deviate outside of this belief system. And then I will check it out, but still, this is the truth, okay? That's not critically examining, you know, what, what we're buying into. And, and until we begin to look closely and, and, and maybe as the experiment begin to, to ask ourselves, is this working? You look at the Bible and, and we're given all these promises uh, that, that we're supposed to be, you know, like the fruits of the Spirit and the goodness and, and, the, and the goodwill and, and even the peace of mind and the peace in the midst of the storms and all these attributes that is, as believers we're supposed to be experiencing and, and, and the peace in the midst of the storm. Yeah, we have peace, but it's usually after the storm. We have no peace in the midst of the storm. So, so all these things that, that we, we do read and we do embrace and we do recognize and we even promise other people when we're witnessing to them, we don't, we, don't, we don't feel these ourselves. We don't experience them ourselves. And so I'm suggesting today, not, not as a, a condemnation, but if, if we're sitting here not experiencing the promises that we're, we're recognizing, Scripture is telling us that we're supposed to be living through a mindset and a peace and a, and a calmness and a love for humanity, a love for, for all men, even our enemies, and we're not doing that. We, we have to recognize that there's something wrong with this model that we've been given, and we have to critically examine it and try to find out why. Because I just find it amazing. Me that, 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 that even some of my ideas are being challenged. And, and even like the last program, we were talking about the wheat and the tares. I mean, I was putting it out there as far as the scriptures, and we're going verse by verse. But, but no, it can't be that, because that's not what Mama taught me. That's not what, you know that's not right. You know that's not right. Every group is saying that, but each group is not even agreeing with each other. That right there will tell you something. We have to find some way to begin to look at this thing that we have bought into critically. And recognize that we're well in the eyes of God. If you're a believer, you've accepted Jesus Christ. You have no, nothing to be afraid of. You can challenge tradition. We, Martin Luther challenged tradition, and, and we envy him. Nicodemus challenged tradition, and we look at him like he was a great man. The Apostle Paul saw he challenged tradition. And there are heroes today. What about today? The tradition needs to be challenged. Getting back to this, this uh, quantum mechanic thing. I mean, like in, in the late 1800s, the scientists had determined, well, we've, we've discovered everything there can be. There's nothing else to discover. You know, now we can just discover things that are smaller and smaller, but the basic principles we understand. Huh. Now they were wrong. They were right for their time. They were cutting edge for their time. They were winning Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, you know, all kinds of, of good things and accolades and, and honor for, for what they were um, discovering and, and understanding back then for that time. But, but as, as we grow, as, as we proceed on in life over the years, we should be understanding more things. <laughs> and that's where we sort of you know, and, and nothing, nothing against David in the Bible. <laughs> but but, but to, to me, 3,000 years after David, 
if we want to understand the attributes of God, and, and we have today what David didn't have. We have David to look at. And, and we have our lives to look at now Plus technology, insight, and understanding of things that David didn't have then. Plus David. We should be understanding God greater than David understood God. And to understand God, we should not simply be going back to the things David said. And, and taking this as, as, as the format or the description of God. We should have something greater. We should, we should understand more than what David understood simply because we have what he had plus we have what we have today. But we're not. Imagine if scientists did that. Imagine if doctors did that. Imagine if any, any kind of technical person did that. We'd be, we'd be riding around on some, well we wouldn't be riding around, we'd be walking everywhere we go. We wouldn't be flying, we wouldn't, there'd be no technology. God, God is a part of, of, of our society. God is a part of our technology. God is a part of the scientists. God is a part of our intellect. And we should be using that intellect to critically look at the archaic, many of the archaic traditions and beliefs that, that have been passed down to us through the years and recognize we can update it, we can upgrade it, and we can fix it so that the generations following us can have something greater than what we had, as we should have something greater than the generation that came before us, even in our religious beliefs. How's that? 